stand against me. Hello, mate. Hello. Good morning and welcome back to the Star of Blonde. So we came back for block two of filming in August 2011, and we were into shooting with Luke Evans as Bard. The first scene, block two. There you go. Bam. My first day on set was on the rooftops of Lake Town. It was like, hey, welcome to New Zealand. Throw this harness on. We've got a team of stunt guys over there. They're going to make you fly. Action! <laughs> I can fly! <laughs> Cut! I think Pete was testing me. You will see what they're uh, made of, Luke. He was seeing how far he could push me. <laughs> and then they added fire to that, and they added speed to that. And we proceeded to do that for almost 15 hours on the first day. Yeah, you need to pace it up. It needs some feel like you just... Oh, oh. OK. <laughs> and then go. Even the stuntmen on that day were coming up to me and going, just say when you can't do any more. <laughs> At some point, you'll fall over, so we'll keep going until you... <laughs> I'll keep going until you fall over. All right? OK. And I remember going, nope, I'm going to keep going. Yeah. He had an intense day that day, running around roofs, and it wasn't easy. The slopes were 40 degrees, so pretty steep. Did you get that? Yeah, of course I did. Oh, we got that. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you had something to hold on, you were going to slide off. You were actually going to physically slide off. My hands were shredded, but I'd got through that first day. You said actors don't work hard. What? Well, that's the rooftops. Nasty. This particular first day back, it was very, very cold in the morning, and everyone was sort of talking about how, how unusually cold it was. And then someone comes running in and tells us to come and look outside. Suddenly, in Wellington, for the first time in living memory, we end up with a snowstorm at Stone Street. It snowed in Wellington for the first time in 40 years. And I remember one point sort of looking down while I'm standing on top of a rooftop and everybody's disappeared. And I mean, where the hell are they? And they were all outside catching snowflakes in their mouths, like two-year-old children. <laughs> it was a major distraction to most of the crew because most of them just wanted to spend the day outside. Wellington in the summer. Oh, I mean, Wellington, obviously, being so close to the sea, very, very rarely gets snowstorms. Well, the capital's better known for its wind, but it's been transformed into what the Prime Minister is calling a winter wonderland. They were going crazy. <laughs> like, like, they were going, oh my God, was that, that, like, oh, 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 they're snowing. And they're big snowflakes. I mean, they were pressing their faces against the window. Look, look, look at the snow, look. <laughs> wow, that's almost hail. So it starts hailing, and it was so loud mainly because of the hail, that you had to yell to speak to the person five feet away from you. It's uh, 1.4 degrees. There's copious amounts of hail on the ground. You kidding me? Hmm, hang on. Um, apparently there's frogs out there now. And there's frogs on the ground. Yep, running around in the snow. We should stay shooting all night since we can't drive home and we can't, there's no beds here, we can't sleep, so we may as well keep shooting and take tomorrow off. It's not a bad idea. And then we could build snowmen in the morning before we go home. You know, the weather's kind of crap outside. It's probably going to be crap tomorrow morning coming into work, so Andy's just going to say a... So have brief prayer for those driving home. <laughs> <laughs> if your vehicle goes into any type of skid, you stay off your brakes. Being from Europe, I was like, what's the big deal, you know? It's just like... 
that much of hail. It was a scattering of sleet. But they took it very, very seriously and thought the world was coming to an end, really. But I didn't. And three, two, one, action! When you have Luke trying to maneuver up these very, very tight spaces with big, long arrows and a big, long bow, every now and then something is going to get caught up. It was the biggest obstacle course, yeah, and I had to move fast. You had to, I had to get up through this staircase with a two-meter bow and arrow, and then when you finally made it to the top of the bell tower, there was this giant swinging bell that was in my way. There wasn't much room once you were up on the bell tower and you had this bell up there swinging around, and poor Luke up there as well. Yeah, you're right, Luke. No. That bell was a total pain in the backside for me. <sighs> Oh, f***ing hell. <laughs> hell. Once more, once more, come on. Last try. The second that Peter had the idea to chop that rope, I was like, thank God. <laughs> this bow that I finally used in the film, was, it's a long bow, which is huge, like two meters ten, so it's actually taller than myself. This thing was massive. You could not hold it in a generic fashion. And if he was just to draw a regular, the draw would have would have barely even flexed the bow. For an hour to, to work on this side, bow, they've been I've been pulling from here. The art style of archery was more developed from Japanese longbow. And you have to understand the Japanese longbow is about six and a half feet tall. Traditionally, how you would shoot that is actually you go up and then you draw and pull it down. But filmic wise, we had to sort of dirty him up. I'm not going to say gangster it, but actually make it more human. And what we had Luke do was an overhand grab. If I do an overhand, right. and I do it, right. So he's almost knocking and laying at the same time, and then he's ready to fire. But it would be obviously impossible to shoot a normal arrow at Smaug and hope to do anything more than irritate him. The Black Arrow is a really good example of how an idea has to evolve. Right. It's a serious bit of all there. Yeah. We know that Bard has to shoot the Black Arrow with his bow. We know, therefore, that with a long bow, Bard has this length of draw. Therefore, the arrow arguably can't be much longer than this length of draw. And we said, well, OK, well, here's the size of Schmau, because remember, we were making this dragon bloody big. The, the size of smog was um, two 747s wing to wing for smog, and then again, two 747s for the length. I mean, the arrow is going to have to be big. I mean, there's just nothing you can do about a teeny tiny little arrow than this massive dragon that isn't going to look stupid. We had to get this arrow big enough so that at least it felt like it was formidable for a creature that size. We ended up with an arrow that was about six and a half foot long. Even the head of the arrow had its own evolution. I remember drawing dozens of arrowheads. Every now and then, a doodle would appear in the corner of a sheet of paper or in a notebook. Eventually, I ended up designing this arrow with a hole in the head, set off at 90 degrees from the shaft to the point. The head of the arrow had to communicate its ability to self-bore into hardened flesh. It's like a corkscrew that you take a cork out of a bottle with, and that's where the head of the arrow came from. The first thing I did, the most, probably the most high energy thing I did was the first scene I did, no easing in. My son's first scene with me, <laughs> he cuts my eyebrow with the back arrow. It's just an arrow, son! Sorry. That's all right. Yeah, it's fine. Just a war wound. Just another one. <laughs> yep. Which then, when we revisited the scenes after that, months later, they had to add a, a blood cut to my eyebrow because it was part of the scene. It happened in the scene, and we couldn't get rid of it. You'll look up, you know, out of this debris, and, he, and he's gone. You're hanging on this broken tower, and you just scream, bang, some of this is going to be good, by the way. I, oh, right. I was making this up this morning. Okay. Anyway. And eventually, when it came time to have to kill Schmaug and we're going to have to use the Black Arrow, we had to put our heads together. How are we going to do it? <laughs>
he went through a few ideas of how we were going to shoot this arrow, because this arrow is enormous. It's almost the size of a javelin, so impossible to shoot out of a bow. I literally just came up with this concept that the long bow gets broken, snapped in half, which was, again, a good thing, because even if you thought he might be able to shoot this arrow from a long bow, it's now broken. It's actually yes. split in half. It's so the, drag the dragon's coming around, and you've, got, you've only got a few seconds, so you wedge the broken bits in there, and you lean back o over the back of the tower, holding onto this huge big arrow, and you get Bane to sit there with, you know, you say left, left, right, and then you just let the let go and it goes, shoom, past his ear. Past his ear, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nobody watching the movie will think that that's how he's going to shoot the dragon. But when you see it actually happen, you think, well, there's no other way he could have done it, you know. But this poor kid's just looking at his dad, and over his shoulder, his dad can see this monster <laughs> flying towards them. That was great, mate. There's some good bits in that. There was a day on Lake Town where we had sent all the extras home. We had no extras, but we had a bit of time left in the day, so we decided to shoot the start of Smaug's attack on the city. It was like, well, we can get on the phone and call people, but it's going to be another you know, hour before we can physically get people to Miramar, or we just get the crew. We'd get this phone call, and every department, especially offset, would have to give up you know, three or four of their crew drop what you're doing, go to costume and makeup. Okay. <laughs> Rachel panting of fear. This is what happens when you get crew. My hair was too short, so I just had to go to makeup, put a wig on very quickly. You look beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, come on, hurry up. Get on there. Come on, oh, quickly, quickly. Yeah. They're waiting for you. Hey, we're not touching you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think I was pushing a barrel. And I remember Peter on the voice of God just always going, come on, guy, because he knew the crew members. So he was naming them by their names on the voice of God. Everybody could hear. It could be that Eric and, and uh, the car and the two guards had a kind of attraction towards each other. <laughs> we don't armor, we don't garments. We applied ourselves. We, yeah, we still have to be counted. Corin just loves getting on camera. He'll do anything to get on camera, as will most of the on-set crew. Move along, you. Move along. This is an example of how multi-skilled the New Zealand film industry really is. My line for today would be, <laughs> I'll take on the dragon. Do you actually have a line, Roy? No, no, I don't have a line. That was a big day. We just had crew running around in costume. Yeah. Most work I've done all year. Well, I, I'm sort of feeling quite nervous about it all, you know. You weren't expecting a star turn, Mum? Is that no, what you're I saying? No. Exactly. I hadn't really realised what it would mean to my mum to be an extra in Lake Town. I'm realising an ambition to be an extra on The Hobbit. My son, Orlando, invited me over, wanted some help with my grandson, so, of course, I was only too happy to come and help. He just took his hiding. <laughs> I spoke to Pete. He was like, yeah, of course, she's got to be an extra. He'd be a lovely son. Why not pop her in there too and make it a family affair? She lent us her son for so many years and she did a great job. Come on, let's get with me. We're going to be burnt. That was great, Mum. Um, in your undergarments, like you're just coming out of bed. You want to film me in my undergarments? Yes. <laughs> but, but, you know, not, 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 Brazil, not, not 2000, oh. 2012 undergarments. Oh, still across the... Lake oh. Town undergarments. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just, we'll just, just give a seat here and we'll ask questions. You're like a perfect Lake Town lady. <laughs> Remember to breathe, Mum, OK? Yes. Don't worry. Yeah. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> and she was walking around behind the scenes going, <gasps> Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. That's pretty good. What's going on? Do, I, do my hands come into this? No, I don't yes. think you need your hands in it, Mum. It's just there, burning. It's, it's not doing it too much. It's very, it's not too big. It's an inner fire, Mum. It's an inner fire. Yes, think of that fire going on. It's burning in your stomach. Like, uh, my, my job is easy today. Somebody's going to say action? No, I haven't said action yet. Oh, yes. Don't worry, you'll hear. God saying action, Sonia. <laughs> we only employ the best. <laughs> yes, I agree. A little curious, a little nervous. Here we go, and action. The 
they've woken the dragon. They've brought an apocalypse upon our heads. There is that scene where you guys decide to pack up all the the rather sad treasures of the city oh, yes, indeed. to escape. Yeah. If the master comes in the door, looks around, makes sure no one no one's here, and there's a secret thing on the floor. And he does he does that. Oh <laughs> God. Wait. <laughs> Bravo! <laughs> that is brilliant! I had to do that party trick. <laughs> I'm afraid I can't help showing off, Mr. Bond. <laughs> There's at least three hours you're never going to see, or well, two and a half hours you're never going to see. Um, or if you do, it'll only be in a special, special tape like this one you're watching now. Thank you for watching this. You're the only person who's ever seen this far. No one else has, has actually managed to get this. You alone are watching this gold that's going on, this backstage gold. I brought a rather inquisitive Chardonnay along with me. <laughs> Top of the world! King of the canal! Whee! Today's actually been one of the most um, exciting days on the on on the set I've had so far. I think this block it's been absolutely brilliant. We've been doing the Master of Lake Town and Alfred escaping. Master! Master! We're taking their prisoners. We've got the four oarsmen of the apocalypse, as I very amusingly call them, <laughs> and they are pulling us along at high speed. Sorry, sorry, I must do. That's your trademark voice. Sorry, I'm so sorry. No, um, <laughs> I do apologise. I, I, that was free for all. Free for all. <laughs> I'm suddenly it's, channeling it's Gollum. In the public domain. <laughs> um. <laughs> anyone here been strangled? Anyone, anyone here do that thing in hotel rooms? Uh, it's not. Uh, don't, don't be ashamed. Um, well. you know, I do enjoy a bit of choking every now and again. Yeah, it's very annoying, that stomach, though. Let's just be reminded of it. <laughs> I felt very sexy in his fat suit. Wicked, 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 wicked. I saw you shaking that gut. <laughs> this is my last day on the beach, and this is probably my last scene in which I meet my end. I have to look up above and see this enormous dragon bearing down on me in my last moments. Three, two, one! Ah, it's rather wonderful to be outside in this huge area. I keep thinking I'm inside, but of course we're actually outside. And there's a moon behind a very misty cloud. They built an outdoor lake town, which was completely different to the indoor lake town and I sail my barge down this huge canal in the second film. Yay! That was fantastic. Yep. Let's buy that one. OK. Because we're outside here in the back lot, we want to be able to control the sun, and we've built this huge, big system of silks that are suspended on poles up here. It's basically the same system as the Colosseum used in ancient Rome to shade its visitors who were there to watch the gladiatorial battles. We've nicknamed it the Colosseum, and it's basically um, a series of shade cloth that we can pull out in 25 metre long panels, four metres wide. Its main purpose is to shade the sun, because the sun's too bright for the digital cameras to take the contrast out of it. And it was fast. You know, if Andrew wanted to move something somewhere, can you just shade that area over there? Two guys would just pull it down and it would be done. The shade cloth material itself is an opaque shade cloth. So what that means is that it gives you a lovely soft light when you're blocking the sun out. But when it gets dark, you can hit it with a few lights and it can actually also fill back in and give you the same lovely light. So it meant we could shoot longer. And at night time, if we are bouncing the light off them, you would swear that you're in daytime. I remember driving home one night at about one o'clock in the morning. I must have been about two miles away, and I could see this glow over the mountains. And I was thinking, my god, the aliens have landed. I saw a photo of it from the hill, where they had these huge lights bouncing off these big screens to make it look like sunlight. And um, from a distance, you could see that from anywhere in Wellington. But what we didn't know was the light was passing through that up into the sky. <laughs> about 200 metres away from the final approach for the aircraft coming into Wellington Airport. And uh, we got a visit from a couple of policemen at the gate telling us we had to turn our lights off because they were affecting the pilots on their final approach. 
So that's Lake Town. That's the back lot. We're going to burn it now. I'm looking forward to actually setting fire to things, truth be told, for real. It is why we built it. It'd be a shame not to burn it. Well, we've done some previews on this stuff, and most of the really big shots will be CG, obviously, digital shots. So what's important to shoot here is punctuating everything with short, sharp, staccato, kind of shocking or poignant moments. What we wanted to do was to very much find the human response to this, you know, this kind of firebombing, really. See the human cost, I suppose. You know, smog is coming down, and we have to imagine him coming down and yeah, yeah. breathing fire and, you know, burning all our houses. And so lots of reactions of running around and plenty of screaming. <laughs> It's just going to be one of those days when it's just great to be a stuntman. Yeah. Yeah, good times. You just got to look absolutely terrified. You're never going to see your parents again, basically. No celebrating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic work, everyone. Thank you very much. Terrific. So that was uh, you know, gratifying to see in the in the final movie, uh, seeing a lot of the shots we did on the second unit. Three, two, one! Go! Oh! 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 Go! Oh! Oh! Open water! The third movie opens with the destruction of Lake Town and you know, culminating in the death of Schmel. That's connected with the previous film. But in some funny ways, it's not particularly connected to this film, although the advantage of that for the third movie is that we get to start the third movie with like a James Bond type pre credit sequence, seven or eight minutes of just sheer mayhem and action. One of the things that we were reminiscing on was when we saw the two towers when it starts with Gandalf fighting the Balrog. You know, and as soon as you jump into the film, you're in the middle of this event. We were hoping to achieve the same thing with Lake Town, that it just pulls the audience in immediately. Well, I just really started with out of control fires, just looking at reference and trying to understand, you know, scale wise, how big can you get a fire, you know? And Smog is intent on destroying as much as possible. His personality is pretty sadistic. I mean, he's kind of a psychopath, isn't he? <laughs> you know, there's not a lot of empathy there. So I tried to convey a little bit of that in the original sketches. This dragon is just basically showing off. He wants to reinstigate the fear that he thinks is waning because people are talking about revenge. Revenge, revenge, what revenge? There's nobody to revenge. There's no ability to revenge me. And so he sets about proving that point quite adamantly. He just comes in for this blistering attack and just lays a big swathe of fire a nice line through the town, and that's his first attack. Although, interestingly, we'd explored ideas and taken them quite far of Smaug. Actually, the first thing he does was destroy the causeway with his talons. He's obviously cutting off their means of escape, and then do it about face, and he just incinerated like hundreds of innocent people fleeing, which was pretty scary. That stuff got cut out, I think, because it was a little bit possibly too murderous. You see Smog attacking the city, and mostly he's trying to do the most damage possible. His main strategy is to just light up the town. And what that gives us when we're in it is this incredible firestorm, but also this heat storm. We created what we call these fire tornadoes, and that's what really drives a lot of the action. That was something that Peter specifically asked for, and he said, if you reference some of the World War II fire bombings, they would create these tornadoes that would rip through. So if you look at some of the shots, and there's some street level shots too, where you look in the background, you'll see these fire tornadoes that we were making, and there was so much fire roaring that it almost created windstorms of fire. The big complication of this Lake Town scene is that Pete wanted Smog to be walking on the buildings. To have a building hold itself together in a realistic way, uh, you have to put the nails in the right spot. 
we had to put in tons of what we would call constraints, which is ways of nailing the boards together. This is where we introduce the 50, 60, 70,000 nails that have to go into the building. Where the blue and the red lines meet together, that's actually where the nail goes. It's holding everything together, all the wood tiles, the uh, little splinters. It's what makes this building stand. Smog is walking on the buildings. Peter wanted to make sure they still felt strong and that they would eventually give under his weight, but that they weren't too flimsy. I mean, I think what's cool about it is that, it, is that you do press on it, you know, and it uh, really yeah. gives way. PJ demonstrated the other day by grabbing an empty tissue box and putting his hand on it and then going <laughs> in the review. <laughs> it was quite cool. And that's what we're doing here. Imagine that as a tissue box. Bang. Is that your child? You cannot save him from the fire. He will burn. Smaug's death was a critical point in the film, so we wanted to get it just right. I'm going back now. When I was, uh, when I was 10, I got this book, The Hobbit. I copied the drawing on the cover, which is Tolkien's sketch, is Smaug hit by the Black Arrow over Lake Town. The drawing captured my imagination when I was 10, enough to try and draw it myself. Years and years later, the previous sequence came through and I saw the Lake Town sequence and here was this shot with Smorg in his death throes rising up from Lake Town as like, you know, goosebumps. <laughs> hey, Graham. I've been working as an animator at Weta for 12 years. Over the 12 years, I've never asked for a shot. I said, look, if this particular shot is still available, go, uh, you know, I'd love to have a crack at it. Peter wanted him like a 747 ploughing into all the buildings. So he's going on his back, turns over, pushes and launches all in the one action. We needed something very solid for him to get a, get a purchase on. Graham remembered that Lake Town was built on the remains of an ancient city called Esgaroth, and that was made out of stone, and there's still a lot of stone ruins spread amongst the town. I found a nice archway from Esgaroth. So there's a good substantial piece to put in the right place so that Smaug could get a claw onto it and push off of that. And then the note was great. Approved. Now that's probably the best note I've got from Peter since King Kong. <laughs> and you know, yeah, the, the 10 year old Graham thanks you, Peter Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> for the actual kind of death scene itself. It was specifically Benedict, his voice that was used yeah. because, you know, realistically, animal sounds or kind of even constructed sounds like that can only go so far to present that to the audience in a way which kind of captures the emotion of it. And when you've got a Benedict kind of vocal driving that, then you've got the complete package. <laughs> The featured shot of Smell dying, it's probably one of the money shots of the film, actually. Peter asked us to think of him like a drowning man, you know, trying to claw his way to the surface and, and save himself. He's trying to <laughs> claw his way up into the sky. Yeah. We just used every control we basically had to tell the story of him choking. His tongue was kind of walloping in his mouth and his lips were quivering, his jaw was shaking. We built on film two's puppet and added an eye bulge control <laughs> because it felt like as he was gasping and choking and dying that his eyes would kind of bulge out a little bit and sort of not only disbelief but just choking. We were very proud of the result there. By ending the sequence on the death of Schmaug, we did want to connect the concept of the Battle of the Five Armies with Schmaug getting killed in the destruction of Lake Town. So just before the name of the film comes up, we return to Thorin. The second that dragon dies, Thorin knows that he has a battle on his hands to protect what is rightly his, his homeland and the wealth within his homeland, and he heads off towards Erebor. So when the Battle of the Five Armies comes up, the audience are immediately thinking, ah, now we know where this is going to head. <laughs>